Good morning, everyone. Uh, I thank you for being here uh, so soon after uh, Whitney Houston, Marilyn Monroe, and then I understand the effort to be here now. Um, uh, before giving the floor to our speaker, speakers, Sergio Amadeo and Chris Martin, I would like to make a brief introduction. Uh, there is a broad consensus on the risks posed by the use of algorithmic systems and AI associated to massive collection of personal data in various fields such as medicine, education, agriculture. Especially when it comes to political process, the spread and use of the mentioned technologies may set specific threats to democracy as we know. Some of the facts already documented are discrimination, the compromising of freedom of expression, and elections in which results are led by the use of big data techniques to drive disinformation campaigns. Out of the topic has been widely discussed in many countries and IGF, as we saw last year in Paris, the outcomes haven't reflected the formulation of public policies and regulation capable to facing the challenge. At the Brazilian Internet Steering Committee, the revelations about the influence of Cambridge Analytica and Facebook over the US presidential election result led to organization of a series of debates that culminated in publication of the uh, guide Internet Democracy and Elections that is available in our website and in the production of proposition to the combat of disinformation in electoral process which is about to be released in the current year. The publications point out several topics that deserve special attention. Um, arbitrary use of personal data by the platforms, mainly Facebook, WhatsApp, Google, and YouTube. Use of algorithms to formulate profiling and trigger the sending of target messages and use. Exploiting fears, insecurities, vulnerabilities of voters without transparency and disrespect to the data protection law, significant market power of the platforms and their roles uh, as monopolies in world markets. Besides these aspects, in 2018 Brazilian elections, we noticed another factor that contributed to an enormous disinformation campaign. More than 80 million internet users have data cap plans associated with zero rating to access uh, Facebook and WhatsApp. Considering the importance of mobile phones for assessing internet in Brazil, 83% of classes D and E and 63% of class C do it exclusively through mobile devices, according to the statistics produced by CGIBR and CTIC-BR, therefore zero rating played, played a central role in disinformation campaigns. So market companies which supported the political parties used this situation in financed that political campaigns using mailing of WhatsApp to spread defamatory information against the opponent candidate, uh, counting on the fact that citizens with access only to Facebook and WhatsApp could not have internet access to verify received news. 
important highlight so that this practice is now under judgment in, on superior electoral court in Brazil. We, now, you, uh, we know that there are important initiatives like the ethics guideline for a trustworthy launched, uh, launched by European Council in April this year, or the work developed by OECD on AI focusing on ethical principles that can serve as guidance for regulators and policymakers. But we also know that in parallel to these efforts, in international trade treaties, TTIP, uh, TISA, and TPP, personal data, data protection safeguards, more specifically data transfer rules, and the imposition of rules for greater transparency and accountability in algorithm systems and AI have been drastically reduced. In this scenario, uh, the Rights Network Coalition, a group that brings together more than 35 NGOs in Brazil, of which I am a member, has defended the need for developing co-regulation frameworks with the platforms based on uh, internet principles, data protections law, consumer rights, Marco Civil da Internet, our constitution of internet, and the electoral law, so as to hold companies accountable for their practices in electoral campaigns. Finally, I want to highlight a recent piece of news. Twitter made a statement that it will not commercialize electoral propaganda while regulatory discussion on the issue are not uh, mature enough. They do not want to risk serving as an instrument for abusive practices that lead to misinformation and misuse of personal data. We will ask him that they uh, uh, make real this promise. But, Uh, made this initial consideration, I move to uh, explain the, the, our workshop. The workshop will be divided into three blocks. In the first block, we will have uh, two presentations of 10 minutes, each one. And first, Ms., uh, Mr. Chris Martin, and then Mr. Uh, Sergio Amadeu. Uh, Chris Martin is a professor in uh, from the University of Sussex and Sergio Amadeu, he is from uh, Universidade Federal do ABC in Sao Paulo, Brazil. Uh, unfortunately, Mr. Scott Cunningham is not able to participate here in our session. In the second block, we will be open uh, the, the debate and uh, we are following follow two questions. What are the main challenges to regulate the use of algorithms considering the following dimensions? Transparency, secrecy, audit, and others. Participants will be given three minutes to present their ideas. In the third and final block, participants will be invited to discuss the following questions. What regulatory and governance approaches can be implemented to regulate the use of algorithm in political campaigns? Also, three minutes to uh, uh, speeches. Finally, I would like to thank everyone who have come here in Friday morning and thank especially Mrs. Lorena Jom, Olivia Bandeira, and Gustavo Gindri to uh, whom we ask it to bring specific contributions. Thank you. I open the session, giving the floor to Mr. Chris Martin. Thank you, Flavia. I want to recognize that Flavia is a real hero of open internet and internet freedom, and I think we should uh, not allow her to be unduly modest about these things. Um, and I want to thank my friends from CGI for inviting me back. Uh, we've collaborated over a number of years, and it's always been incredibly useful to compare what you think might be two very contrasting countries, uh, but where there's actually a lot of similarities. And it's good to know that one of our similarities is the extent to which fake news is distorting our democratic process. I'm not sure if that's good, but at least it's good to compare. Um, so I am talking about a report that I published with Tricia Meyer, Dr. Tricia Meyer from the Free University of Brussels, who some of you may have met earlier in the week. Uh, it's a report that was commissioned by the European Parliament that we presented to the European Parliament this time last year in Strasbourg. 
I will say since this report, uh, I have then gone on to work with um, Dr. Ian Brown, who some of you know from uh, Oxford, who is now actually a visiting fellow, a uh, visiting professor at FGV in Rio, uh, also a visiting professor at uh, Research ICC Africa in Cape Town. Uh, and we're working as part of a team looking at the Commonwealth and the way in which cybersecurity, including disinformation, uh, has uh, been corrupted and uh, has uh, affected elections across the Commonwealth. Uh, so that's a piece of work which is not yet public, but which will be soon. Uh, and so, in fact, last week I was uh, presenting in Warsaw to the network of uh, election observers who are updating their guidelines in order to acknowledge that election observers coming from uh, OSCE, OAS, and so on, need to update their work to look at disinformation as a specific element of cybersecurity. And this was a, an area of huge interest uh, to the election observers. Um, I also just want to acknowledge, if I was in the United Kingdom, I would be part of the National Professors' Strike. Um, our pension is under threat yet again. Uh, and so when I get back to the UK, I will be sitting on a picket line rather than being able to, to research. Uh, but given that I'm here, uh, I will carry on. So, um, disinformation, uh, false, inaccurate, or misleading information, intentionally attempting to cause public harm, as opposed to misinformation, which is unintentional and will then be corrected. If you provide misinformation that you don't correct, that almost by definition makes it disinformation. Uh, and we're looking in this uh, study at automated content recognition. Uh, there's a definition there, I won't go on in detail, but of course it is the AI of which we're speaking, algorithmic uh, uh, attempts to control content. Um, and one of the problems that we have, of course, is that algorithms are prone to false negatives and positives. Uh, very, very difficult to actually analyze natural language using algorithms. Uh, and ACR has more reported success in identifying bot accounts rather than specific instances of hate speech. Uh, and this is a real problem which has been acknowledged by Mark Zuckerberg, amongst others. Uh, and it's a very rapidly moving target, disinformation. So just for the European Parliament report, we analyzed 250 articles, papers, and reports, many of which were published that year. Um, of course, this was uh, uh, published at a time when we were just two years after the Trump election and the Brexit referendum in the UK. And I will say we have a glorious opportunity in real time right now and over the next two to three weeks to watch the extent to which disinformation can influence the UK general election. Uh, because the rules have not been changed in the UK since the Brexit referendum. Uh, so we still have a real, to use the cliche, a real wild west of disinformation in our elections. Uh, to the point that last night, preposterously, a minister turned up to a, a party leader debate claiming he could act as the party leader um, and got himself filmed. So, um, Facebook uh, is at the center of this and the uses of Facebook. This is Mark Zuckerberg's empty seat, uh, which was for an international uh, committee of members of uh, parliaments from Brazil, from Argentina, from Canada, from the United Kingdom and from other countries. Um, so this is the, uh, the tweet that was put out by the UK's committee dealing with these issues. Um, on November the 27th of last year, nine countries, 24 official representatives, representing 447 million people. One question, where is Mark Zuckerberg? Did not turn up. This is the thing that we're talking about when it comes to Brexit. This is the chance of Brexit happening in the weeks leading up to the election. Uh, you will see at the uh, bottom right, Joe Cox assassinated. A British member of parliament was assassinated by a fascist sympathizer a week before the referendum in 2016. As a result of that uh, election, uh, or rather uh, the campaigning around the re referendum, was suspended for three days, or so we thought. And it was only in July 2018, two years later, that Facebook was forced by the British Parliamentary Committee to reveal that the Leave, the Brexit campaigns, did not suspend campaigning for three days. They spent loads of money on Facebook within 24 hours. Um, and you will see, sorry, I, I can't see the, the slide up again. Thank you. Um, and you will see there that the chance of Brexit went down substantially as a result. This is the, uh, this is the, the odds from the gambling firms who are always correct. Uh, but they were incorrect in this case because even they hadn't spotted the waterfall of money that was going on to Facebook, which we only found out about two years later. 
And I will say the report from the British Parliamentary Committee is highly critical of Facebook for its failure to be transparent with the committee over that two-year period. Okay, and the result, of course, is this um, frog-faced individual uh, achieving Brexit. Um, and these are the alternatives we're faced with now. I just want to concentrate particularly on this graphic. Um, as you can see, there is a trail of money going in different directions. Top left is the official Vote Leave campaign. You'll recognize there Boris Johnson, who is now our Prime Minister. Uh, Dominic Cummings, who is his chief advisor, although claims to have resigned for the purposes of the election. Uh, Michael Gove, who is the minister uh, uh, who was last night claiming to be representing Boris and trying to get into the debate. On the top uh, right, you see the Leave EU, the unofficial campaign, uh, Farage and Banks. And in the middle, you see Cambridge Analytica, which is actually just a, a defunct subset of SCL, a much larger group. And you see there Steve Bannon, the uh, US far right figure who was a guru for Donald Trump, Alexander Nix, uh, Robert Mercer, who's funding um, a lot of these uh, attempts, and the whistleblower Christopher Wiley. And in the bottom uh, left, you see two students representing a splinter group called Believe. Uh, Believe was meant to represent um, uh, the uh, students who were interested in Brexit. They received £625,000 the week before the election. That's almost a million euros, a million dollars, the week before the election. It never went to the Believe bank account. It went directly to Aggregate IQ, which is a Canadian company which was placing the adverts in Facebook for them. Just to repeat, it went from Vote Leave directly to Aggregate IQ with the claim that it went through Believe, but it never went to their bank account. It went directly from Vote Leave to Aggregate IQ. You also see there a sum of money from the Democratic Unionist Party of Northern Ireland. Northern Ireland is part of the United Kingdom. It's particularly interesting because there is no requirement for transparency of political funding in Northern Ireland uh, due to, obviously, its history of terrorism. The decision was that all donations are allowed to be anonymous. They were spending a very large amount of money with Aggregate IQ. What a coincidence, you may think. Um, also a Brexit supporting party. So extraordinary things were taking place in the Brexit referendum. All of this has been brought to light by the UK Parliamentary Committee. All of this has been denied by the individuals concerned. They, went, they uh, appealed. All parties uh, on this particular graphic, certainly Vote Leave and Leave EU, have been found to have broken electoral financing rules by the UK Electoral Commission. Both the UK Electoral Commission and the UK uh, Data Protection Authority have uh, produced reports, very powerful reports, telling the British Parliament that our electoral laws are broken, that they must be reformed in order to have fair elections in future. All of these reports have been uh, responded to by government with something very, very close to contempt. There has been no reform of the law whatsoever. So what can we do? Well, this is the International Grand Committee. You can probably spot your own country on there, uh, including Singapore, Latvia, and Ireland, and France. Uh, well, we're stuck in this situation where we're basically being experimented on using PSYOPs. Um, if you uh, think back to the 70s, when we look at countries like Chile, uh, even the 60s in Brazil, we're familiar with the fact that the military has been uh, becoming very sophisticated in how to influence populations, and this is what we're doing. Um, I just want to flag up this particular individual, Neil Mohan. He's the YouTube guy. He's the guy who's paid a fortune by YouTube to make YouTube into the most powerful recommender engine available. So if your kids are suddenly watching Jordan Peterson videos, Neil Mohan is the man who you should thank for his wonderful work. Um, he's a Canadian family man who would not, I'm sure, recognize his role in disinformation. But hey, he built the engine that's then been used. So I won't go through methodology, uh, uh, but I will just, uh, I think, skip very quickly. Oh, just say, of course, Zuckerberg himself says, yeah, we find it really hard to identify uh, using algorithms, uh, the fake news and other problems that we have. Um, we, we're much better at finding nudity using AI than we are at finding uh, disinformation uh, because this is a nuanced linguistic challenge and of course humans are rather good at nuanced linguistic challenges, algorithms are very bad at it. Um, so I just want to say, uh, uh, first of all just to say legislators should not push this uh, exercise onto online intermediaries. Our clock is not working so I'm assuming I have two minutes left, I hope that's fair to say. 
Um, and we should certainly make sure that human rights laws are paramount in the way that we look at freedom online and how disinformation works. So, I will say this. Five recommendations. Media literacy, which is not just uh, media literacy and no one has to do anything. We need strong human review and appeal processes where AI is used to find disinformation. We need independent appeal and audit of platforms. We cannot trust platforms' internal processes for dealing with these things. We also need to standardize notice and appeal procedures. Uh, and David Kay, rapporteur for the United Nations on freedom of expression, has suggested creating a multi-stakeholder body to look at appeals so that it's not handled uh, simply by either governments or by platforms. And finally, trans uh, transparency in uh, disinformation techniques is re we really just don't know enough about what's happening. So just to mention one in particular, disinformation is best tackled, of course, through media pluralism li and literacy initiatives, but that is not just saying educate the public. It's saying because platforms are not being transparent, the public cannot be educated yet. Transparency by the platforms is essential for us to be able to see what's happening in our social media feeds. And when Twitter and YouTube and Facebook and others change the algorithms without giving us sufficient information to know what's happening, we can't do anything about that. Okay, so just wrapping up, I just say number two is pretty obvious. Regulatory action needs strong, independent human review and appeal processes. Uh, so is uh, item three that we should have independent appeal and audit of platform regulation. This is very much in line with what Flavia said. Co-regulation, not self-regulation. Self-regulation had its chance, and the platforms blew it. They didn't cooperate. They didn't show how transparent they could be on their own. It is time for governments to step in, not to regulate directly, but to tell them, you will provide the information that we need. I will caution just one thing, of course. My story from the UK reminds us the people who make the rules about how to combat disinformation in elections are the parties that have just won the last election. This makes it particularly prone to regulatory capture, and we must always remember that is the problem. And so I'll just wrap up. Standardized notice and appeal procedures, I mentioned that David Kay, and that we have a lack of independent uh, uh, evidence in this area. Um, and so I will leave you with this shock and awe graph of what we presented to the European Parliament, where we gave them six different options for what we should do, and we came out in favor of option number four. That option zero, by the way, is do nothing. Um, and we came down in there in favor of basically option four, which is co-regulation. I will make the slides available after the uh, session, and I thank everybody for their attention on the post-APC final morning of the, play of the thing. You should all give yourselves a little slap on the back for being here this morning. So thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you, Chris. Uh, I, I want to uh, make a clarification. Uh, Mr. Uh, the Professor Scott is here. We had uh, problems, communication problems, and I ask you if you can uh, talk in the second and third part of the session. Now I will pass the, the, the floor to Sergio Madeu, and then we can uh, hear you. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, lies and exaggeration have always existed in politics. Nowadays, the problem becomes serious when disinformation becomes more relevant than information. That's have happened in Brazil. In 2018, 70% of Brazilians accessed the internet and 62.3% made it every day. Among internet users, 75 declared to use online social network, mainly Facebook. 70 percent watched online videos, and 92 percent use instant message applications, including WhatsApp. 
Considering this favorable connective scenario, the political campaigns took place mainly in the internet and instant message application was the tool choose to the disseminations of fake news. In the Brazilian private market, the micro-target and programmatic networks were already being used in 2018. The use of bots also played an important role. The number of rob robots in digital networks grow from 1,000 in 2017 to 70,000 in 2008, according survey conducted with 66 bot developer companies. Hiring digital influencers on YouTube were another feature widely used by powerful brands. All of these strategies were employed on digital platforms operated by algorithms in Brazil. Undoubtedly, occasional lies and hype have always present in electoral process. What are the important differences that occurred in 2008? Internet users, on average, spend four hours, 48 minutes online daily, mainly through smartphones. This has generated a large increase in the speed of dissemination of information and disinformation. Zero rating model reinforced the use of WhatsApp among the most impoverished part of the population. Groups of businessmen have paid large-scale disinformation campaigns that reach millions of Brazilians. Several information distribution companies on WhatsApp offered by the elections committees bypassing the legislation and the electoral justice control. The platform, especially WhatsApp, didn't provide the electoral court with suspicious activist metadata, such as telephone numbers that distribute content for more than 5,000 profiles. Fact-checking groups played an important role in exposing waves of disinformation, but they reach only those segments of society that clear, uh, clearly defend democracy. Algorithm detection of disinformation is precarious and dangerous, since not all content can be checked only within the network. It requires research, research and filed work. Algorithm mapping, mapping of disinformation flux in a given network can be done by platforms, but that wasn't done in Brazil. The algorithmic process of modulation, which can be summarized as the control of what is seen by members of an online social network, has been hired by third parties who paid for, for the dissemination of offensive content and the calculated public through digital platforms. After the elections, Facebook expelled companies that produce disinformation through fake profiles, such as the case of ArtMed's group. Fake profiles were created by companies and groups known as digital militias and operated by people hired to attack and disseminate hate speech. Here defined as misogynistic, homophobic, racist, and incitement or promotion of violence content that could have been and can be detected by algorithms.
the Brazilian hate groups use disinformation, uh, use disinformation um, as their main political communication strategy. Uh, we will not be able to reduce the damaging effects of disinformation to democracy, and we will not recognize that this current process is not spontaneous, that it is actually driven and orchestrated by a specific act authors. How to combat, for example, the disinformation in the face of technological possibilities of deep fake. The deep learning algorithm can insert into digital video a person who was not at the place where the image was captured. It can create moving images from a photo because the deep learning algorithm detects biometric and body patterns very accurately. There are two problems. The first, the first is how to detect it. The second is the effect of creating distrust of true facts by placing this information on the same level as information. Thank you. Thank you, Sergio. Uh, now we are open the second phase of our workshop, and um, we'll, we'll put in the, the slides the, the questions to uh, Gindri, Olivia, uh, Lorena, uh, speech, anything, give us the thoughts about the issues. Thank you. Do you? Begin. Can you start? Okay. Okay. So, um, so I come from the. Um, I work at the intersection of ethics, um, history, and technology, and my work has been based on trying to understand how, um, or what the social impact of um, algorithmic systems is. So. Um, so when I look at it, of course, I need to understand the technicalities of it, but there's also, as Joseph Weissenbaum said, when we talk about algorithmic systems, we talk about social technical systems. So um, you, cannot, you cannot understand um, the technique without the context, the social context with, within which it is embedded. And that social context does have, and does have a lot of influence not only on the way how those techniques are programmed, but also on how humans, um, the human uptake of that type of technology, which at the same time also influences the, algor the algorithmic systems. When we talk about um, many of the algorithmic systems used in social media, those are learning systems. So this means that they modify and are modified through the data and through the reactions of the users. So it's not a static situation where you would say there's only Facebook and Twitter creating the algorithms and then that's it. Um, the um, factors and the actors that are influencing these type of systems is way bigger than just um, the developers at Facebook and Twitter. It's also us users. It's also um, the societal uh, context within which those systems are being used. So that means that algorithmic systems from Facebook being used in Brazil will have a different development to a certain extent than the ones being used, let's say, in Bangladesh, just simply because societies are different and the human uptake of those technologies is different and also the socioeconomical situation. So, um, um, it depends a lot whether you're using a laptop or a mobile phone. It depends a lot um, uh, on which type of economical incentives you have to use this type of technology. So all these things need to be considered to really understand what's the impact. Now, um, 
when we talk about this information, we are actually talking about a phenomenon that is quite old. We're talking about propaganda. We're talking about strategies to um, play political influences. And we've been studying these in the pre-internet era. And we've developed methodologies, both in communication sciences and in history. There's a lot of scholarships that has been done um, before the internet. Uh, started to be used at a commercial level. So now when you start trying to understand this phenomenon in the internet, you need to justify what type of methodology you're using and if you're using a different one than the ones we have been using for the last decades, you need to understand why and you need to justify why you're measuring differently. Um, so let me tell you how propaganda is being analyze in the analog sector. Um, in the analog sector, communication sciences, um, there was Harald Lassersfeld, he had this hypodermic needle theory thinking that if you see something, this is going to have an impact on you and it, this plays a role. Um, this theory uh, was created uh, at the very beginnings of the 20th century. and. Um, we don't use that theory anymore because we don't believe that it is that simple to influence someone. If you take a look at the effort that the Third Reich, at the effort that Mussolini and the Francos and all the autocracies of this world made to influence and to change a whole society, it started by just creating a very complex um, narrative that would not only extend to politics, but also to culture, to sports. Uh, it would create very fine granular crowdsource methods of surveillance so that neighbors would surveil each other and cooperate and tell the government. So it was very complex. Every aspect of your life would lead you to the assumption that everyone thinks the same. That is what would so to say, nudged you into changing your belief system because you would think, I am the only one here. It doesn't matter whether I'm in my professional space or I'm in my private space, in my leisure space, everything seems to think the same. Now, this means that for a propaganda scholar, it, what you look at when you try to understand how, to, to what degree propaganda is being spread and is having an impact, because it's not only about how much advertisements, how much misinformation is being um, made, but it's also about what is the effect that it is having, how many people are really seeing it and perceiving it. So what we measure is not whether people are in a filter bubble. We don't measure, what we measure is how much diverging opinions are you able to see? That is what counts. And actually right now, most of the studies that are trying to show that there is an impact are using the hypodermic theory and hypodermic needle theory, which is not, not considered as scientific anymore, um, and are counting things that propaganda scholars would never ever count. And they have not justified why. The scholars that come from communication sciences and from history and are using and are starting to analyze what is happening in the internet since 2016, and I'm talking about scholars at Duke University, um, um, Stanford, Brown University, Oxford. Um, there's, there's a huge range of studies. You can, I can show you afterwards if you want to come. Um, there's a few new ones even. They have never ever found a real political bot. They're still looking for. All these studies about bots have been debunked. So I'd really love to see a single bot. With, I, I belong to a network of 140 scientists across 40 countries. We have never ever found a bot. Um, and the other thing is that because our public sphere is so complex, um, even though we might only have a filter, but we might only look at confirmation and have our friends confirming us of the ideas that um, we think are true. Um, our real life is way more complex than our interaction with our computers or our mobile phones. 
we also interact with other people. So even though we might see everything here only that seems to confirm what we think, that doesn't mean that it's the only factor that influences what uh, in the very end leads us to vote. And by the way, what we have seen in studies right now show that people interacting with this information are the people that are less likely to be influenced by misinformation. Thank you very much. I give the floor now to uh, Gustavo Gindri, and I ask, please introduce yourself. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for the invitation. I'm Gustavo Gindri from uh, National Regulatory Body of uh, Audiovisual in Brazil. So I, I have three minutes, that's it. I will be briefly. Uh, I have three minutes, that's it. Okay, okay. <laughs> okay, yeah. <laughs> well, I read. Um, since I knew that my colleagues here would exploit the specific problem of the performance of algorithms in the electoral process, I chose to make a speech focusing on two broader issues, but which I think are uh, inevitable when we talk about the impact of algorithms in our society. Sorry uh, if I seem to get away from this specific topic, but I think these questions will directly influence the action of the algorithms in the electoral process. Uh, firstly, uh, we have the problem of semantics used in public and private databases. A data will only make sense if it has semantics, but the semantics is a construction that brings about a social process and a worldview. And several studies show that a slight variation in semantics of a data set can change profoundly the outcome of an algorithm procedure. Therefore, it's essential that database ontologies are available for public debate, or certain words views may be naturalized without our knowing. Uh, the second question concerns the problem of scrutability. Uh, in order for us to define those responsible for an action, it's essential to understand the causal network involved, or in another way, how it came uh, to a certain result. This is how, for example, all legal standards work. We define an action, a procedure, a result, and uh, one or more responsibles. But, uh, and this is the point that I, I want to highlight, uh, when we move out of a, a simple data mining into the territory of uh, unsupervised learning and deep learning, uh, it becomes increasingly difficult to scrutinize the procedures performed by algorithms. Uh, and this, and at this point, uh, allow, allow me uh, three quotes. The first one, uh, understanding is a good thing. It's the very purpose of many of us. But another important goal is inventing new methods, new techniques, and yes, new tricks. In the history of science and technology, the engineer artifacts have almost always anticipated the theoretical understanding. Uh, this is what Ian LeCun, VP and the chief artificial intelligence scientist at Facebook. The second one, let's stop expecting to find a simple theory and instead embrace complexity. Use as much data as possible to help define or estimate the complex models we need to, uh, for these complex domains. And this is, was uh, Peter Novak, director of uh, research at Google. Uh, as we can see, the lack of explanatory models doesn't seem to be such a serious problem for Google and uh, Facebook researchers. But not everyone agrees with that. David Gunning, then director of DARPA's uh, uh, Explainable Artificial Intelligence Project, recognized it as a problem that, in quotes, Intel analysts use artificial intelligence tools to keep up with the volume of data, but they don't get an explanation of why the system is speaking a particular image or a particular situation. Uh, the gnosiological problem of the difficulty of understanding how a given result was achieved may have severe social, legal, and political implications. And it is important to build scrutiny standards that are incorporated as a fundamental requirement for making their algorithms. Or we will soon face serious legal problems in dealing with decision-making by algorithms and the definition of responsibilities. 
Thank you, Gustavo. Professor Scott, can you talk with us a little bit? Thank you. Uh, let me introduce myself briefly. I um, was most recently um, at Delft University of Technology, and now I'm a professor of political science at University of Strathclyde. Uh, while in the Netherlands, uh, I worked with a Blue Ribbon Committee advising the uh, second chamber of the Dutch Parliament about uh, the roles of algorithm uh, in politics. Uh, but I came here today uh, just to reflect with you about uh, the role of algorithms in the U.S. election. And uh, as was reflected on by some of the speakers, uh, the evidence is inconclusive. Uh, it's very concerning, but the evidence is inconclusive uh, that specific uh, uh, targeted interventions happened. No, well, there were three things that happened, for sure. There was a uh, data was stolen from the Democratic National Convention uh, regarding uh, uh, election uh, data, citizen data. Uh, there were social media um, efforts made, and then there were targeting of specific uh, uh, election groups. So the results in the U.S. sadly was not unexpected. There was a 25% chance that Trump would be elected. He did get elected. Uh, so it wasn't out of the bounds of possibility. Uh, what is concerning, though, were very narrow uh, margins in tipping point states such as Pennsylvania and Wisconsin. So basically what, what happened here that is of most concern is uh, the use of citizen data uh, for political purposes, uh, which has been going on for a long time, and the use of algorithms to dissuade key target uh, citizens to, to not vote. So what seems to be effective, unfortunately, in the U.S. process is to disengage, disenroll. It's much more difficult to mobilize and convert citizens, but it's quite easy to say, distrust your government and don't bother to show up uh, for votes when it matters. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor. Uh, I pass the floor to Olivia. Can you introduce you and make your consideration, please? Good morning, everyone. I am Olivia Bandeira from Intervozes. Intervozes is a Brazilian organization that works for safeguarding freedom of expression and human rights in traditional media and in the internet understand them as, as essential to democracy. Uh, last year, we followed the role played by technology in the Brazilian elections, and early next year, we will we, we release a book on this information that contains these analyses, as well as a chapter on possible solutions for promoting a more diverse and democratic media environment. In this first participation, I just want to highlight some issues concerning the influence, influence of internet, uh, the, the, the dominant business model of internet on democratic debate and the elections. Uh, well, we know that one of the main features of digital platforms is the massive use of data. Using big data, the, the advertising market uses increasingly customized strategies to reach certain groups of users or particular users whose mapped habits are inputs to strategies for selling products and services or for the propagation of ideas and even of applications. In the case of political marketing, data is critical to enable micro-targeting micro techniques. In order to break this logic, it is essential that the rights to personal data are considered in the list of human rights. It's not just an individual dimension, but it's a collective one. It's essential to democracy. Uh, the second point I would like to highlight is the lack of transparency in digital platform practices in relation to algorithms. This harms the full autonomy of users in relation to the type of communication they receive which has a great influence on democratic debate and ele electoral process. We therefore need to criticize algorithmic op opacity as well. The third point is that uh, we fight this information uh, that's a part of the problem uh, with more inf information, so it's essential to ensure that the network connection service is taken and guaranteed as an essential service uh, and to finish, it's, it's related to the, to this, the, the 
dimension of diversity, I, I would like to highlight the need to combat digital monopolies and promote diversity and plurality in the digital environment. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Olivia. I ask if uh, Mr. Charles Mark wants to uh, give us any explanation. Okay, please. Uh, hi, uh, I am from Hong Kong and uh, I've been listening in to the discussion about misinformation and the impact on elections and so on. Uh, the uh, situation we have in Hong Kong is a little bit different from what you have uh, been discussed. Uh, the impact and the prevalence uh, and the widespread use of misinformation is actually very much identical, but the source is somewhat different. It is from China, not from you know some of the other examples that you have cited, uh, including you know the U.S. election, pr probably interference from some other foreign countries, and so on. In our situation, uh, I think, uh, mm -hmm. including in the very recent election uh, that he was held actually on Sunday, uh, despite the uh, presence of a lot and lot of misinformation, I have to say that the result was not that much influenced by the misinformation. Now, having said that, it doesn't mean that the problem is not there. Uh, you might recall that in a few, uh, a couple months ago, Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube, they all took down uh, thousands of website uh, uh, accounts, accounts that were uh, alleged to be uh, 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 controlled by China state media. And uh, at that stage, uh, actually, um, it could be derived that a lot of these misinformation sources were actually, uh, they, were, they were all said to be related to the situation in Hong Kong. As you know, in the last half year, there has been a lot of conflicts and uh, uh, protests against the government. But the, interestingly, these misinformation are not necessarily targeted again about, uh, toward the people inside of Hong Kong. They are targeted toward Chinese people outside of Hong Kong to influence their views about Hong Kong. <laughs> so I just want to uh, caution that uh, the problems uh, can be multifaceted and the ways to tackle these problems uh, would be, uh, would need to be multifaceted as well. And finally, one last point is that uh, in Hong Kong we are a little bit disadvantaged in the fact that we still do not have a domestic uh, fact check organization. And that is one area that we are trying to address uh, with academics and journalists and so on. Uh, so right now, uh, we are even a bit behind other Asian countries or region in that regard. So that uh, even for some of the social media companies, they would not have a very reliable a uh, partner in terms of doing professional fact check to work with. So those are all, that is also one area that we are trying to work on. Thank you. Uh, I ask if uh, Mr. Hamazasp wants to make any considerations about the issue. No. Well, I. I oh, okay. I think that. That's an incredibly powerful contribution from Hong Kong, and obviously we acknowledge that the, the British have very trivial problems compared to problems in other parts of the world, and I think we need a little bit of humility about <coughs> claiming how, how terrible our life is. It's what we've inflicted on the rest of the world is rather more terrible than what we're suffering now. So, um, I just want to make a point, which is that you'll often hear uh, governments and politicians say, well, of course, can you show us the proof that online disinformation has changed election results so that we have to act. And it's worth remembering that, of course, disinformation online, as, as was just pointed out, is part of a much broader media uh, environment. And studies for hundreds of people, I, I very much take on the, the points that were made about um, the socio-technical context of disinformation. Media, including newspapers and television and uh, and other sources have been around for a very long time. We have never been able to conclusively prove that any one medium has swung an election. 
um, despite the greatest efforts of you know, Murdoch's media empire and all the others, and O Globo and, and so on. And so therefore, the, the assumption that somehow we have to prove that online disinformation is swinging an election is of course an impossible barrier to overcome. And those who say, right, show me the proof and then we'll act, know that it's an impossible barrier to overcome. Uh, even in the US presidential election, I know that the estimates are that cable news providing free live coverage of all the Trump rallies was one to two billion dollars of free cable, cable TV advertising. So as part of the mix, we know disinformation both on and offline is very powerful, but do not, uh, do, you know, do not ask any uh, scientist to prove that it swung an election because humans are more complicated than that and society is more complicated than that. It can't be done. So anyone who raises that as being, we'll act once you prove it, is saying we're, not, we're never gonna act. Thank you, Chris. Uh, the floor is open to the participants, please. Anybody wants to talk? Ah. Yeah, thank you, good morning. Uh, my name is Bia Barbosa, I am a journalist from Brazil. Um, from Intervozes, I work with Olivia and Flavia in, in digital rights and dig communication rights in general in Brazil. Actually, I would like to ask uh, Lorena if you could go a little bit further on the last thing that you mentioned in your intervention when you started saying that the people that are more, they interact more with the disinformation are the people less, uh, that, that has less chance to believe in this information. So it was the last thing, I, I don't know if I got it right, but I would like you to go a little bit further, to ask you to go if you could go deep a little bit on this topic. Thank you for the question. Um, yeah, what I say is that the people who are most likely to interact with the political and influence campaigns are less likely to be influenced by them because they already um, are on the same page. Um, so um, one of the things that are important to understand uh, when it comes to information, this information is, among others, the function of this information. What is it appealing to? Is it appealing to convince you that the facts that you seem to think are true are different and give you and provide, a, provide you with other type of facts? Or is it a different function? And in conventional studies, uh, also in philosophy, but also historians, in, we had this conversation before during the Cold War, among others. And there is this very well-known essay in philosophy by um, Harry Frankfurt on bullshit, it's called. That's really the name. Um, and he tries and, 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 and he summarizes the knowledge that people on the stems had gathered, and he basically comes to the conclusion that the function of this type of disinformation strategies is not to convince you of the truth, but it has um, an identity function. It is um, a, a discourse of domination, and it's a discourse of ideology. People that adhere to that type of discourse adhere in the same way that they would adhere to a religion. It's not about the facts. They know that it's not about the facts, and if you use facts to counter that position, you're gonna push them even more into that position. This is what was found out on those days. And this seems to be equally the case, um, and I think that this is one of the interesting analysis of the conversations that we are seeing with fact-checking and people contesting to the fact-checkers. It's a polarizing discussion. It's not a discussion that is changing people with extreme positions from their positions. It resonates with people that already believe in, um, and it, it, that have, so, so it's really interesting to, um, also try to gather the knowledge that we already had and try to analyze how type of different discussions we have. If we want to have a dialogue, 
arguments will play a role, but in order to do that, we need a fairly different context and a fairly different situation so that arguments can be exchanged. And the disinformation level, that's an identity and domination level. That is not the level where you exchange arguments. And this is what makes it so hard. And this is why fact-checking is not really helping, in my opinion, and according to what I see. Please. Introduce yourself, please. Thank you. I'm uh, Elisabetta Fierro. I'm a member of uh, the IMA, that is an association that is uh, doing research to um, enhance uh, cybersecurity policies. Um, so I have some questions about also the information governance, uh, because of course uh, there are uh, marginalized uh, communities who have uh, no access to some information, and uh, of course uh, the risk of uh, violations and abuses is higher. For example, um, I come from the south of Italy, and it's incredible uh, the escalation of violence and abuses that is going on. Also, political violence, uh, policymakers uh, are uh, not protected. Uh, so. Um, there is this augmented violence uh, uh, on one side uh, uh, because um, so criminal organization uh, have uh, uh, um, access to augmented technologies like also mind control technologies, uh, psychotronic weapons is uh, awful, uh, terrible what uh, happens. Uh, so I'm asking for help uh, if it's possible to have access to anti-harassment centers uh, um, or uh, ask the help of uh, ethical commissions who can uh, have the power to uh, like uh, take action and avoid uh, further uh, human rights violations, uh, the risk of mass atrocities because uh, uh, it's terrible what can happen with these mind control technologies. Uh, so it's possible to um, like uh, target uh, groups of people uh, and uh, it's uh, dangerous uh, uh, ignoring uh, and also uh, so I'm afraid of the, there's so much indifference of lack of capacity uh, so I'm asking for help and uh, I hope that uh, so we could uh, um, in the future, protect democracy, human rights, uh, identity, human dignity, and uh, so use technology as a means to enhance uh, uh, the quality uh, of life for everybody. So uh, do not exploit or uh, uh, use uh, our power, uh, so technology as a means to exploit and uh, um, you know, humiliate people who have no access to or uh, are just uh, have been marginalized. Thank you very much. Thank you. Anybody more? Okay. Hello, good morning. My name is Carol Douglas from Trinidad and Tobago. I'm the uh, telecommunications regulator of Trinidad and Tobago. I'm the executive officer of legal and enforcement. And I just thought I would uh, add a contribution to the fact that two years or three years ago we had elections. And very strangely, persons were receiving email and text messages on their phone uh, advising of who to vote for. And as you would probably know now, that is quite controversial. It is the center of the controversy concerning the Cambridge Analytica um, fiasco, where it was discovered at that time that Trinidad and Tobago was being used as a guinea pig, as an experiment to be used in the bigger countries of the United States and in the, in the UK. So what happened, and I actually got a call from the election um, EBC, which is the Election and Boundaries Commission, and they asked, well, how is it possible that person's information would be available to political parties and or um, online profiles and be targeted? So we're very interested. Now, there are elections in next year in Trinidad. And of course, we're quite interested to see how it's going to play out and what will be the effect this year 
um, of that type of profiling. So it's quite, so we're very interested to see. Um, we are still trying to find out. We are now doing investigations. Um, the police are now uh, in England, I think, trying to understand uh, how was it possible that Cambridge Analytica, and, and there's a book, uh, it's a mind, but I won't say the second word, um, which explains how data was collected and used and then targeted. So I just thought that I would mention that it's, it's very interesting for us to see how um, companies are using data and algorithms and, and as a such that targeting people. So I just thought I'd give that small contribution. Okay, thank you. Lorena wants to talk Oh, Flavia, about can I just quickly respond because I have to go. Um, I have okay. a plane to catch. This is not fake news, it's real. Um, of course, SCL boasted about their influencing the 2010 Trinidad election by voter suppression techniques, knowing it would influence different parts of the community in different ways. Um, I believe we may be coming to your island soon for this Commonwealth study. So please email me, um, Chris Marsden Sussex, uh, because we would be delighted to meet up and talk. That was a really interesting uh, uh, part of a case study for us. Thank you. And I apologize for leaving slightly early, Flavia. Chris, thank you very much for being uh, for be here with, with us, and good trip for you. Thank you. OK. Thank you. Lorena. Um, just shortly on uh, the systems of Cambridge Analytica. Um, first thing, um, Cambridge Analytica admitted uh, in December in a, in a panel, it's on video and it's online, you can check it. They admitted themselves that they never use um, psychometrics. So they used to say that they do that, and then in the very end they publicly admitted that they didn't. Uh, that's the first thing. And then on the method itself. Um, the method was developed by, among others, someone called Michael Koszynski. Koszynski is well known among scientists because he's not particularly scientifically like seen solid. He's a bad scientist. Michael Koczynski is someone that, among others, has been creating programs that measure the length of the nose and the length of the ears and correlate it to your sexuality. That is called chronology 4.0. That is not science. The computer will give you a result because the computer always gives a result if you tell the computer to correlate X with Y with Z. But that does not mean that the output is scientifically sound and makes sense. And so that's the thing with psychometrics. Truth is, we don't, the, the accuracy it, and, and, and the conceptualization that it provides is quite reductionistic of the idea of how people work, how people can be move or nudge to things. It's way more complicated. If you have data about someone, of course you can target someone over advertisement, but guess what? Um, you probably have seen advertisement from things that do not convince you and you have not been contagious and um, change in your mind because it takes way more, way more than that. And people that are sort of dissenting or unsure about things also need way more than just seeing 1.4 advertisements during the whole electoral elections to change their minds, which is the visibility that, for instance, um, fake news during the Trump elect cam uh, electoral campaigns were seen by um, the voters on 2016. 1.4, that's not much. Um, so again, um, I think that companies like Cambridge Analytica, but of course also Facebook, want you to believe, because it's part of their economical USP, that they have the power to change things. But that is a very reductionistic um, idea of how human beings work and how society influences and how public opinion is created. Thank you, Lorena. You, please introduce yourself. Yeah, uh, thank you very much. Um, hi, I'm uh, Christopher Pereira. I'm uh, uh, I work for World Acquire. We are a political technology consultancy, and we have advised on uh, various, uh, we have advised various um, candidates on election campaigns in Thailand uh, and in Hong Kong um, on the pro-democracy side. 
I would like to raise attention to the fact, especially working on the digital side, that um, there is a lot of focus on uh, criticizing the uh, paid advertising, the paid political advertising. Um, recently, uh, the CEO of Twitter uh, said that uh, Twitter would start banning political advertising, and there was a great um, you know, positive sentiment about that. But I would like to raise the, the issue that algorithms also exist on non-paid uh, social media ch um, communication forms, whether it's what you post, whether it's political, uh, whether it's, sorry, automated bots, fake accounts. Think simply about uh, normal content. For normal content to go viral, there are many algorithms that happen in a, in, behind a black box or uh, determined by the social media giants. Uh, from the point of view of a grassroots driven um, pro-democracy or let's say a, a low resource, low funded political party uh, within a short, uh, who has a very short time span to campaign, um, sometimes paid advertising can be their only option in order to, uh, in order to uh, compete against organizations that have been um, that have built already a huge influence and a huge presence using the other non-paid algorithms. So I just want to raise this point and make aware that when, uh, whenever there's any discussion about understanding and regulating the algorithms of online advertising, we should also think about the non-paid aspect of social media. Thank you very much. Thank you. Anybody? Okay. Uh, good morning. My name is Michael Ogia. I'm the Advocacy and Engagement Manager for the Global Forum for Media Development. And I, I want to add some additional nuance that really kind of piggybacks on some of the comments made here, as well as address um, one of the points that Lorena made about um, fact checking. Because um, first of all, just um, about, uh, I, I agree in general about fact checking, but uh, one of the issues that we have, and actually, sorry, I don't mean to Say, say this in an adversarial way, it's actually a supporting way, especially when it comes to, plat to platform um, content or content on platforms. Often uh, what I hear from our members is that um, after, uh, let's say, uh, a piece of misinformation or disinformation is debunked, unfortunately, or you know, that, that bit that is fact check, the fact check itself doesn't actually get um, elevated. So we see, you know, oftentimes you'll actually end up seeing the, uh, even if a claim has been debunked, it's not necessarily connected to the, the pit of, bit of content that has been fact checked. So there's a key issue there. But then also, at least from our perspective, one of the bigger issues too that we're facing is that for us, one of the best ways to, uh, one of the best antidotes to misinformation and disinformation especially is high quality journalism. But what we're seeing is massive market failure as it relates to supporting high quality information, especially when it comes to local news. Local news is disappearing. And what do we, kind of from our perspective, what is the problem? The problem is that we cannot no longer fund good journalism, especially whenever, um, when there um, has been significant market capture, whether it comes to advertising or whenever it comes to others. I mean, as it stands right now, um, Google and Facebook alone account for around 60 to 70 percent of all digital advertising revenue. And so, what does that mean? Do we definitely need innovation in terms of media markets, but we also need to prioritize journalism and news media within these kinds of conversations and within regulatory conversations. It's not just about combating disinformation by getting rid of it, it's about elevating positive narratives. But those positive narratives takes money to, uh, to support. Thank you. Thank you. Olivia, do you want Zach? Uh, yes, uh, we should discuss this about the regulation, the third part, so uh, I, I want to talk a little bit about this. Um, uh, during this IGF, I have attended to a dozen of sections about artificial intelligence and algorithms. In many cases, I have heard that technology has been regarded as neutral 
as if to solve the problems caused by technology uh, developments, the tech companies should just fix or adjust the algorithms when they commit to any mistakes. Uh, these perspectives hide the political aspects of the technology. Now, who is developing the models behind the algorithms for which purpose? Uh, I heard. Uh, I don't. I didn't heard. Uh, heard a lot about those questions. Uh, this perspective says that it is enough to create principles to be implemented by private companies themselves, ignoring the fact that the internet is more and more dominated by a few companies that use personal data to determine how information is spread. So I would like to contribute to the debate from another perspective. In Latin America, Intervozes and other organizations are discussing a co-regulatory co co approach to the internet that we believe is necessary and possible. Uh, it's a democratic approach that can be an alternative both to the corporate self-regulation and the authoritarian or, or excessive regulation proposed by some governments and congressmen around the world. Uh, when we talk about co-regulation, uh, we understand the creation of a democratic regulatory environment that is fit to the characteristics of the Internet and can contribute to ensure a free and open Internet. According to this co-regulation model, self-regulation, public regulation structures are complemented to formulate legal, contractual and technical solutions by following international human rights standards. Also, the co-regulatory instruments should be a result of a multi-stakeholder governance process that takes into account local and regional contexts. Uh, so in Latin America, uh, in Tevoz, uh, um, with other organizations such as Observacon, that uh, uh, is the leader of this process, and also IDEC, Desarrollo Digital, and other organizations are working on, on a document that offers recommendations on specific principles, standards, and measures designed to establish forms of co-regulation related to content moderation. Um, the aim is to limit the power of major internet platforms, such as social networks and search engines, and prevent private censorship. Uh, the, the document, uh, for now on, is limited to that, but it's a starting point to discuss other objects of regulation, such as algorithms, artificial intelligence, and digital concentration. So I, I just want to invite you to, to read the document on Observacon's website and to continue with this debate. Uh, it's that. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody more? more? Yes. I would like also to put attention into slightly different perspective on algorithms and electoral elections, um, and also make a criticism of Europe. Um, we, um, we are seeing a lot of uh, digital identity systems that are a prerequisite then to participate in the elections, right? And those digital identity systems are now being implemented, for instance, in uh, Zimbabwe or in Kenya. Um, and with that, it's being decided who can vote and who cannot vote because it's not in the system. Or, and, and that is, of course, a slightly different angle to the story. Uh, but that is also a, an algorithmic component or, so to say, an, a, a digital component with which um, already existing regulation that excludes specific ethnicities and specific um, communities from partaking into the political process is being automatized and is being, so to say, magnified and made even more efficient. And those technologies precisely in Africa um, and sub-Saharan Africa that are being um, used for the creation of this type of systems. They do not come from the US and they do not come from China in the majority. Over 70% 70 70 of those technologies come from the European Union. The system in Kenya that is uh, being used, the digital identity system in Kenya that is now being used and it's going to exclude a lot of ethnicities in Kenya, it's from France. And they are expanding. And Germans are also exporting technology like that, Italians as well. Um, so yes, there are monopolies like Google and Amazon and 
um, many of the, on the Microsofts of this world, but there is a whole range that we are not talking about that in the background is coming from many of the countries and many of the regions that we think to be highly morally superior and more ethical than anyone else, and they, it is not like that. We are contributing and creating a narrative that is hiding many of the hidden players that are creating the world as it is in a very subtle way because they are delivering components to bigger companies. So I think that it is important to not only focus on all these Googles and all these Amazons and all these social media, but also to look about all the administrative digital systems that are also part of the mechanisms to um, develop and to proceed with electoral um, campaigns and elections. There's way more than simply social media. And these way more ha might have a bigger, uh, a, a, a legal impact on um, who can vote, within which conditions, and this type of technology is not being researched. I have not seen any studies about that. And those are the people creating the legal and administrative conditions for voting. And it is not the Googles that are doing this. And I think that we're going to be very much surprised when we start unveiling that type of perspective. Thank you very much. Excellent, thank you. Anybody? Okay, you. Hi, my name is Alfredo Velasco. I'm from Ecuador. I, I have a question about uh, the, the, the theme. I, I prefer uh, talk about the democracy, not only the, the uh, electoral process. This is a, a, a few part of a, a total of democracy. Uh, during the riots in Latin America, Chile, uh, Ecuador, Bolivia, we have a, a phenomenon. Uh, in, the, in the case of Ecuador, we have a hashtag about uh, some authorities that, uh, that, th that they uh, uh, was a trend in Venezuela. First, not in Ecuador. The trend is born in Venezuela. And in the, during the riots, the, 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 the beginning of, of the riots at, at, at Chile, the uh, hashtag uh, train, uh, uh, was trained in Ecuador first, then Chile. Uh, we have uh, some hashtag that born in another country that uh, the, 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 the event occurred. Uh, how we work with that? Uh, it, it's it's a, a, a evidence, a technical evidence, that uh, the the interference of another country in the democracies in another country. Thank you. Thank you. You please. I'm uh, Ricardo Corredor from the Jorge Tadeo Lozano University and also from the Global Forum for Media Development. Uh, I, I just have a question for whoever wants to answer from Brazil or from other countries, but it's the role that these big PR, communication and media agencies are playing in this whole thing. Because to me, from what I've seen in, for instance, in the case of Colombia and some other countries in Latin America, is that they are the operational part of this whole thing. Usually politicians, when they try to do something, immediately they hire one of these companies to execute the thing. Or in many cases, it's these companies that offer them services for them to use. So it seems to me they play a key role in this situation, and I was wondering what the thoughts on this were from people here in the panel. Thank you. Sorry, but we doesn't. Ah, you, you. Okay. The last one, because our time is finishing. 
Hi, my name is Aldo, I'm from Honduras, and I want to ask about psychological operations because we haven't talked that yet. And that is something that is happening uh, with rage in Honduras because um, the, the government has this type of, of operations targeting particular human rights defenders and targeting political position, um, people in particular, and they make this thing that they target the 10 most close most, uh, collaborators of this person, and they are heavily um, uh, customized the, the messages. And I think it's actually working because the people, when these operations began, the people uh, tried to not be associated with the person that is being targeted. And we have a, a very um, obnoxious case about Berta Cáceres, for example. She was a really great leader uh, that was killed in 2016. And before, they, before she was killed, uh, they began this kind of campaign. And uh, and ask this because there is a, a kind of disinformation campaign that is actually, actually working. It has a very real um, effect in reality. And that's a question for Flavia because she was saying that they, were, they weren't working in real the disinformation campaigns. And this is also a request of uh, help because in Hondur Honduras is a little country that receives no attention and there are a lot of people trying to